how good, how pleasant for brothers and sisters to come together in the unity like this tonight. It's been a wonderful day. All day long, God has been so very wonderfully real and can't do anything but get better as we go on with this camp meeting. If you'll turn over to the book of Ephesians to begin with here, we're going to go to Acts, first of all, chapter 13, verse 27, then the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. I want to talk to us tonight about a purpose that can't be missed. I talked to this, you know, 40 years ago, at least 40 years ago, God put this message in my heart. I preached, didn't know what it was saying. It got resurrected, and I want to share it with you. There's always more in resurrection than there is in birth, always. You know, everything that God gives has to pass through death. And in that resurrection, the reality of it comes. Isaac, no doubt, was a total miracle. The improbable had become impossible. Abraham is 100 years old. Sarah's womb is dead. There's no oil of a lay those days. I'm telling you, she's practicing to be a prune. If you looked at her, I mean, the whole life was gone. But then Jesus came. The miracle, the miracle happened. And Isaac was born. Uh, the, 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 yeah, the child was born. But he had to pass through death to break all the links of this earth. All of God's working with us. See, this earth was cursed in that fall. No part of it can be in the church. We've tried to make it, but we see the results of it everywhere. So everything, even that which is born of God, has to pass through that death to break that earth link. That was still Abraham's boy till he drew that knife. Then that was over with. He's good as dead, but God stopped him. Now that's God's. God's totally, absolutely for his purpose to come through. That happens, you know, with preaching and with all things in life. They have to pass through that death. Then that earth link is broken. God can freely use the thing as he proposes. I find much of that. You know, I preached for 55 years almost. And I found a lot of pearls. I'd come preach them every Sunday, a new pearl. We'd all get happy about it, but Monday told us none of us bought it. We were the same. Mondays we were last Friday. But I understood that it's more than just finding something. It's something being birthed in you, that that is what you are. Until that happens, all the working of God with every human that he ever called was to make that person what he was going to preach. Till that happened, then it was just words that the man spoke. Here in Philippians, fathers, we read this word from God. That's Ephesians, I'm sorry. As we read this word from God, help us to hear what you're saying tonight. Let it not just be words, but a revelation of our hearts. Speak to us here tonight to both to speak, to hear, and to do. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, here in this, uh, in this great book of Ephesians chapter 4, that is, I'm sorry, uh, I said the final chapter, chapter 4, verse 1, Paul writes it, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you've been called. So easy to miss that, most of the church has. Never realizing why that we're here. I hope God will help me tonight. Now in the book of Acts 13 and 27, that's the book of Acts chapter 13 verse 27. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. They, they, they heard words, but they never heard that voice. A voice always implies a person, and a person that wants to talk to us. 
but it's possible for you to sit here tonight and hear words and never, never hear that voice. That voice, that's God talking to us. And it's possible for us to hear the words. It says so right here and never hear the voice. You know, the above statement there in Acts number, chapter 13, verse 27, indicates there's something more to be heard than the audible voice of the reading of the Word of God. There's something more to be heard here. There's a voice in that Word that, that has to be heard. The voices of the prophet. What were the prophets saying? Israel never knew. When the Christ came that they proclaimed, they crucified Him because they never heard what those prophets were saying. So when He came, they condemned. Those dwelling in Jerusalem could quote the prophets without difficulty. They could quote. They heard every Sabbath. They read. They read. They read. They could quote them, but they never knew what they were saying. They never stopped and asked the question, what does this amount to? How much a church going is that? All of our life, I pastored 35 years. I had people in that Sunday school for 30 years, still mean as a junkyard dog, but they could quote you half of the Bible. They had heard the word, but never heard the voice. They never took a hold of them. It never affected them in the way that God intended that word to affect them. What were these men after? That's a question that has to be asked and answered if you and I, the final generation of this church, are going to repeat what that first generation repeated. Because they never did that. They never stopped to ask that question. They never got past the letter of this Bible. They never, they could quote it, they could say it, but they never got past the letter. Now we're asking these questions now. What is that which is within and behind and deeper than the written spoken words of the prophets? What is God saying to us? Why are we here? Why is there a church in the first place? What does it mean to be a Christian? Is it a matter of going to church, keeping religion alive, having a place where people can get married and bury the dead? What's it all about? We have to hear what the voice is in these words and how then that we attain to that. We know that the prophets were dealing with a situation which by no means represented the mind of God. As they were dealing with the people, they always come at a crisis time. They always come. They had to come against something that had come. They were not popular, but that doesn't mean they were not needed. And time always vindicated them, the real prophet of the Almighty. Now, the conditions did not then nor does it now really represent the Lord's mind and intention where His people was and are concerned. Those now, and I can tell you most of what's going on in religion today does not represent the mind of God. It's no way near what God is after, though we go through the routine Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Millions of people have gone to church in this nation today and never knew why they went there. They never knew the purpose of their being there. These millions have truly been born again, but don't even know why they were born again, because they never heard the voice. Now, the church was born on the day of Pentecost, full of the Holy Ghost. They stirred a world at the moment. They stirred that world, but they never knew what it was all about until the Apostle Paul came. The revelation of why that Spirit came never took a hold of us. They knew that they'd have power. They moved with that power. Peter said, such as I have. But when the revelation itself come, then the chief apostle, the apostle Peter said, this man says a lot of things that's hard to be understood. That tells you he never, with the coming of Pentecost, realized why that Pentecost had come. He never really realized why God had given that spirit. Now, the prophets were dealing with the, with the situation, and because it was like that, the real vocation or reason for the people of God was not being fulfilled because 
of this situation, the whole reason of them being there was not being fulfilled. Now, whereas they ought to be a people of great spiritual strength and impact upon the nation, there was weakness, there was failure. From one time, Malachi is the book of total failure. Everything is in it. All the sensual has broken down in 400 years of darkness follow it. All of it because they never heard what was happening. Now, the prophets all the time in the message sought to get down to the lost uh, cause of the, of the very cause of this awful, awful situation. There has to be a voice raised in this time to know that this is not a purpose-driven thing, not a user-friendly thing. We have no right to distort Christ to make him acceptable to a world that crucified him. But yet that's where we are. And we're believing that just to get a lot of people into a religious service satisfies the heart of God. There's nothing more abominable to God than a people who claim to be His name, claim to be His people, then act, not act rather, according to what He's called us to be. There's nothing more dreadful to me to hear a man talk about the Holy Spirit that's not been filled with that Holy Spirit. There's nothing worse than such a thing because now we're misrepresenting the very cause for which we're called. The prophets were all the things that they, they were all, these were all the things that the prophet hit, sin, all the things that they took in and took. But this one, they all agreed upon as to the cause and was a loss, was a loss of the vision. That's what they all, it was a loss of a vision. Hosea said that the people perished because they had no vision. They never. You see, vision is the thing, this loss of vision. Now, that's the foundation of the thing which, which I want to be occupied with here tonight. I pray God will help me to get inside, not your head, but the heart with the reality. We're facing times ahead of us that only the Holy Ghost is going to stand. I promise you, it looks tranquil tonight, but our world's about to explode. That explosion, not the tribulation, but the thing that's going to precede if we hang around is going to present us an opportunity of reality that we never dreamed was ours. The possibilities. We're going, and a people must be prepared and know why we've came to the kingdom at this time, why we're here, and what would God do with us that we are. We, now listen, Hosea said, My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will reject thee. Thou, thou shalt be no priest to me. Now that's another way of saying my people go to pieces because they don't know why they're here. They're just wandering around in the darkness trying to figure out why I'm here in the first place. Why am I saved? If it's to go to heaven, then why am I not there? Why did he leave me here to face the hell and the trials and the difficulties if that's all there is to it, folks? If I'm only saved to go to heaven, walk around up there and smoke somewhere with a long dress on, then I'm not interested in that. I've, I've saw all of that kind of religion I want to hear. I was born for a purpose that's an eternal purpose, and eternity is going to be the greatest part of it if I just understand why that we're here. Now, this, uh, the, that's a very strong statement. It links with Hosea 8 and 8. Israel is swallowed up. Now, now, see, they are among the nations as a vessel where none is a delight. Does that talk about the church? Who delights in it today? For the most part, there are exceptions. There are people that have stood. But like Daniel, we must identify ourselves with the whole. Like Nehemiah, he was as holy as any man ever was, but he repented for the whole cause of what Israel had sold him into. That has to become a, a truth with us in this awful hour. Now, the, now the, the vision is God's full purpose in redemption. If you ever heard a man, hear me tonight. It's God's full purpose 
in redemption. This applies not to preachers, but to the body, to you and I, to fulfill our purpose upon this planet. It's going to be an awful thing to meet God. God does not wink at ignorance and for you and I to meet him and have plundered away a life, have lived a life on this planet that never affected the cause that God called us for is going to be a dark moment. I said it's going to be a dark moment. You do not find anything concerning Israel that suggests that their gospel was to declare that God brought them out of Egypt. That was not their message. And, and we, but that's what we made the message. That's the whole of the message being preached in our time. But that wasn't. That was not their message. I was, I was told over and over, but that was not their message. I've heard that. You've heard that. We believe that. So today, the whole only message is that you come out, you be saved. That's become. But that's not the message. That's not the vision of God in this hour. There has to be a people that come out before that vision can ever be fulfilled. There has to be a people who it would come to. Their message was what they were brought out for. That's the message. Not that I got out of the world, but why I'm out of that world. Why did God save you and me? What is the purpose of our life, of being upon this planet? It's imperative that I know that, or I'm going to fail miserably in what I'm called. Heaven's going to be a little place for me if I make it at all, if I don't understand. Because if I don't walk in the will of God, then I must be walking outside of that will. What else can it be? Are there any other alternative? You know, so many of us have settled down to preach the coming outside. That, that's what you hear when and fundamentalists, most of the Pentecostals. Now, this is good and right, but it's only part. We have to come out before we can ever go in. Isn't that what the David said? He said, he brought me out that he may bring me in. And if all I've done is come out, I've failed God in this hour. If that's all that's happened to me is that I've come out, then I failed God. He brought me out that he might bring me in. Now, what am I saying? First of all, if you're going all the way to serve God in a full way, you must have revealed to your own heart God's purpose concerning his son. You have to have revealed to that heart. If you're going to move, beyond just being a church-going person. And if you don't fit in and begin to work and allow God to work in you, to will and to do His pleasure, then you're going to wind up a church member that you believe your obligation is to go to church. And if the pastor says pray, we pray. Now, that's all very important. But I can tell you there's something to pray for. There's a goal that I'm birthed for. I've taken out of the millions for a purpose. And if I fail in that purpose, then I fail God, nobody else. Now, the apostles were held back until they broke upon them the full blaze of the meaning of Christ's vision and ascended the glorified Christ. All that signified in the eternal purpose. Don't you leave Jerusalem. What you were saying to them, there is... There is a dispensation you cannot see from this side. You've got to move. It's got to be a spiritual thing. See, the whole question, could we see Christ after that resurrection, after his death and burial? We never knew that. But the apostle Paul came with the reason and the message, God, the revelation of God to his heart. They, they, they had before Pentecost all the facts about Christ. Three years they have been with him. They had all the facts, two of them, very notable, walking along the road discussing the facts about him that died in Jerusalem, a great prophet, all the miracles that he'd done. He'd come along and begin to walk with him. They never knew him. They knew him from the facts. They knew by information, but they knew it, never knew him when he walked with them. What a tragedy of our time, and there's so much of it. He'd come into most churches, they'd call it the devil. 
Amen. Because it creates such a stir in that house by his presence. They walk in long. They knew all the facts about him theologically. But when he walked with them, they didn't know who he was. He from Moses all the way to where they were told them, this book is about me, nothing else. There is nothing in this book that doesn't pertain to me. Didn't our heart burn, they said, as we talked with him along that road. Amen. This, the whole, they, they, they had all the facts, the virgin birth, his life, his teaching, his miracles, his cross. Some of those very men were there when the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son. They were right there. Surely they go now and proclaim what they know, but not so. Tarry you in the city of Jerusalem. I've watched the church make this option. I'm not talking about evangelicals. They never believed it. I'm talking about a Pentecostal church. Amen. That's made this Holy Ghost. This Bible said God was in Christ. How was he in that Christ? By the Holy Spirit. God is in his church. How? By the Holy Ghost. That blood always preceded, uh, Calvary always preceded Pentecost. The, the, the oil uh, was never put on the ear or the thumb till the blood was. It always comes afterward, never before. The blood had to secure a temple, but God has to live in that temple or all we are is a mockery of what God had to say. You say that's harsh. No, it's reality. Amen. I said it's reality. I, I have one purpose in life, that God's Son may be revealed in my life. That's the vision. Listen, that's the vision. What was it that constituted them able to fulfill the command to go? You say, I say the Holy Spirit. It was a coming a Pentecost. Perfectly true, but there's something else. Why the 40 days after the resurrection? Don't you think they were getting through the externals, the events, seeing something, seeing what no human eye could see. Now that that Holy Spirit has come, they're seeing what no human eye could see. They're catching what God is telling. If the Apostle Paul is anything for you and I to go by, he'll tell us plainly that his whole life and ministry and condition was based upon one thing. It pleased God to reveal his son in me. That's why I was born. No other reason. All the heavens rejoiced the night that God saved me, saved pastor, saved you. Why was that? Those angels rejoiced because God now has another place to displace that son or to display that son. And that's the only reason of Christianity that that son can live. It pleased God to reveal, Paul said, listen to it. It pleased God to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. That, that, listen to it. Again, to, I make known to you, brethren, as touching the gospel, which was preached by me, that it was not after man, neither did I receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came to me through revelation of Jesus Christ, that the reason for your being is that my son can live through you. You cannot preach Christ unless Christ is seen in you. But if Christ, if Christ is seen in that life by the Holy Spirit, by your life, by your walk, then you can preach this with power. You can make it real. There's nothing so powerful as a testimony that's real. It pleased God to reveal His Son in me. That's the vision. That's the reason. That's the purpose. There's no other reason for the church to be on this planet. We're not here to keep religion alive. We're here that God's Son may be manifested and walk on this earth. We're the body of Christ. He gave up a body at Calvary. He got a new one at Pentecost. He never changes, but the church has. When they came, listen, now, all other things may be facts which we possess by reading. We may believe it as substance of Christianity, absolutely believe it, convince ourselves, but that does not constitute us missionaries or men of women of God to carry this gospel. Just because you have the facts, knowing 
Knowledge is not possession. We have to know that. We've come to believe. We have a world out there. Believers, they know what Paul knows. They have what Paul has. And so they act. But the devil said to those sons of Siva, I know Paul, I know Jesus, but I don't know anything about you. See, it is possession of this Christ within us. That's the vision. But it can and is missed by most of what's called Christianity today. Do we truly create conditions of life? Does our presence in that neighborhood cause others to live? Do we ride in that airplane, create situations where other people can live? Is out of our being flowing a river that is Christ? You know, when the first time I went into Egypt, I remember flying over that desert, nothing but death, just looking down on that sand, nothing. The wind had blown it like, like an ocean when you look down. But but when you come to that Nile River, it was like the Garden of Eden for maybe two miles on each side. Fruit trees, vegetables, wonderful, a beautiful thing. That river had created conditions of life in that desert. God said, out of you is the flow of river, and that river will create conditions of life in the spiritual desert. There's no other reason for our being here. To go to church, to learn Sunday school, is going to war against us if it don't become a reality to our life. You, when, when we meet him and we say we know, then he's going to say, but I don't know you. That comes out of an intimate relationship. When Christ said, I never knew you, it's the same word when it says that Adam knew his wife. There's a relationship between us that will produce life if I know you, but you're walking around here with your head knowledge of me has produced nothing but an argument among men. Out there said, well, I don't know about them tongues, but I'm telling you, if I, spoke, if I speak in tongues and raise the dead, men will say there must be something to that tongue. Amen. I can talk about this Holy Spirit, but if this Holy Spirit becomes my life, then Christ lives where I am. Wherever I am, that's the vocation that surely can be missed and is missed by the church of the living God. All other things may be fact. The apostles were held back until they broke over them the full meaning of the vision of Christ. They never were allowed to go. When they went out, and we find their message was always not the gospel of God concerning personal religion. That was not their gospel, but the gospel of God concerning his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God spoke that to me. He said they went everywhere preaching Christ. Not their own personal conversion. There was that testimony. But their message wasn't. Their message was concerning his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And because that Christ could be seen in their lives, they turned the world upside down, folks, because Christ was made alive. When men can take knowledge that Jesus is in you, they know the resurrection to be a reality. And anybody that sits in this church, in our churches, ought to leave here knowing that Christ is alive. Because there was a manifestation of that resurrection through our lives as to what we are and what we do, both. They went out, and we find their message was always that. They had seen not the historic Christ, amen, no, no, but the glorified Christ of God, and they had not just seen him as an objective vision, but his true significance had broken upon them, that Christ is all or all is nothing, that all the knowledge that pertains to life and godliness is in this Christ. And Paul's cry all the way to the end was that I might know him and the power of that resurrection and the fellowship of that suffering, being made conformable to that death. That, that was the message of the great preacher from the time he met him. They had seen, they had seen. But this glorified Christ of God, they had not seen. They would saw the historic Christ. They had walked with him. But the apostle said, we don't know that Christ no more. Don't know the Christ after the flesh. This is a Christ that lives in you. This is a Christ that the Holy Ghost, when you talk about the Holy Ghost, you're talking about Christ because he come back in that spirit to live. He that has been with you, he said to them, who 
who's been with him? Three years he's been with him. Now, that same one is going to be in you by the Holy Spirit. That is the gospel of Christ. That is a gospel, the only effective gospel that my life on this planet demonstrates Christ alive. That wherever I am, there should be questions about our life. Why are you different than me? If I talk like they talk, if I laugh at what they laugh at, if I'm entertained like they are, then there's no different than them than me. Why are you different than I am? Why are these rocks piled up here? Because God parted this river. There has to be that place that we can point. Our life should be a question mark in the minds of people. We should be so different from this rotten world and what it makes men that there'd be a question mark. Why do you live like you do? Why are you like you are? Nothing so opens the door of the gospel than a life that Christ lives in. When they can see him. Not that you're raising the dead. Everybody don't do that. But you're different. And you're not different by the rules of religion. This is what I am. Amen. I, 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 you know, I, I smoke all the cigarettes I want to smoke, drink all the uh, alcohol I want to drink, go to all the movies I want to go to. I just don't want that no more. It's a different life. It isn't a matter. I don't go to those things, don't do those things to be saved. It's because I'm saved that they have no interest in my life. I've watched that holiness that turned convictions and reality of God into rules of religion, then hate everything that didn't look like it. You get saved in that church, if you can't grow your hair a foot in 10 days, then you're, you're outside. You never fit into it. But I learned this is a life. It's Christ in me that is the hope of glory. That is the vision of God. That's the purpose of God. And the church has no other reason to be on this planet but what God's Son can live in that church. Because there's no hope for anybody apart from that Son. But He must be revealed. What a change took place when they really saw. Here they are, even though he said, my kingdom is not of this world, as one of them wants to be the vice president and the other secretary of state. You let him be on the right hand, me on the left. They still wanted a kingdom of this earth. They still never broke loose from it all. But when that wind blew through that upper room, it's a different man now. Anemic men become powerful preachers of the gospel. Uh, 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 an apostle Peter uh, that, that just always... Uh, moving out on something, always in trouble, not going to let the Christ die, not going to let him wash his feet all of the time. All of a sudden, he stood that day and faced a mob with a message that that thousand saw something in that preacher. They knew Christ had risen from the dead. In that crowd with the people that nailed him to that cross, make no mistake about it. And they're crying, what must we do to be saved? Instead of killing him, we've multiplied him a million in time. They recognize the world's in trouble now unless they accept this Christ. This is the purpose of the church of the living God. Before Pentecost, they thought in terms of the coming Messiah who would set up a temporal kingdom and deliver them from Rome, from the Romans. They would be notable people here on earth and would overthrow the Romans. That thing on earth was their full and only vision. They couldn't get it out of them. Right up to the end, they wanted to have the right hand and the left hand. But when Pentecost came, the revelation came of why I'm here. Christ has come in me to live. I am the kingdom of God. It is in me now. It is the reign of God in the human heart. That is the kingdom. Christ is the kingdom. That was made very, very plain. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. John introduced the kingdom of God. And when Jesus told us in Matthew 6, 33, concerning that kingdom, he personalized it. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He is the only righteousness there is. That kingdom being lived in me and through me is a testimony of a world that Christ didn't stay in that tomb. They haven't found him and Mary Magdalene buried together. Amen. Doesn't matter what a world say. There are no bones in that tomb. I've been there. Amen. He rose. He lives today in the heart of men. That's a message of the gospel of Christ.
That is why. That is the vocation. Walk worthy of that vocation. What that means is walk like Christ. To do that, you've got to think like Him. Your whole thought life must be upon Him. The whole of our life must be brought, every thought, in subjection to Christ. Amen. To walk worthy of that vocation, that, that when men see you, they see the Christ. There's something about that life. Our life is so lived, amen, that men come to say at times, no man can do that except God be with them. You have to, like the Pharisees, lay it on demons, or you have to say God is with that people. That, that, that is the key to life. That's a testimony of the church, of the living God. The thing which before had such a hold on them vanished after seeing the kingdom of God on that day of Pentecost. He said, there's some of you standing here They'll see, not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in power. That's Matthew 16, 28. What is his kingdom? It is Christ for above all rule and authority, the center and the goal of all divine counsels of eternity. Christ everything. That is the message. Nothing beyond. In that day, that cross set right between Malachi, the gospel of total failure, Everything that's essential failed that day. That cross is erected between Malachi and Matthew, not just a separation of the Old and New Testament, but a moving from the sensual to the spiritual. Amen. On one side, that cross said, this is finished. No more the sensual. No more the Word. But on the other side was a new beginning. It was Christ. Everything now is spiritual. Christ alive, living in His church. Amen. Multiplied millions and millions of times in the 2,000 years since Pentecost. Amen. What is His kingdom? It is Christ far above it all. That's not mere words, but the import needs to be apprehended. You must have a vision in your heart before you can be a servant of God who will get very far, and you must have a growing vision of that Christ. That I might know Him has to be the testimony of our life. Not just going to church, feel like I have dispensed my obligation to God by going and listen to a sermon that 99% never intended to obey in the first place. Amen. They just heard and went and they can talk about something that never was a part of their life. But it's when that Christ comes to live within me and then the message is to know Him. There's no revelation beyond. There's no more new beginnings. Everything from, from the Garden of Eden till that moment when that Christ appeared was waiting on that one revelation of God. Everything was. There's no more. All revelation now is to, as, to, as to who He is. Let us follow on, said Hosea, to know the Lord. Hosea 6 and 3. Oh, that I might know Him. It's a growing, progressive vision that brings us through to God's full end in our life. That's what He's after. When you and I uh, meet Him, it's not going to be so much of how, how many missionaries we sent out, but what we sent out as missionaries. Did we send people out that Christ was revealed in their lives? That's, that's really it's imperative that you and I put them through a place, the school of Christ, some way, to make them know what Christ is all about, why you are here. It isn't a head knowledge of going to change anybody. Amen. It is when I'm there, you're there. That's what made us. That's what Wilkerson said. He said, I travel this world preaching to preachers, and there's no ministry on this planet that I run into any more than the school of Christ. Why? If he goes to Guatemala, our students are going to be in his platform. I mean, they're going to be in the meeting. They're going to be there talking for Christ. We never just send out a signal. We send out a vessel full of God. Oh, that God would let us see. Walk worthy of this vocation. Walk where it's not I, but Christ. I, Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. He's a representative man. That's the church. We are crucified with Christ. Why? That Christ may live. That Christ may, may live. It must be like that. Not being content with a few facts about Christ and salvation, but having the eyes of our heart enlightened. 
that I might know why I'm on this planet. Oh, how that will guard. And, and less and less when you know this, will anything of this earth, I, I don't care if it never play a Super Bowl again. I wouldn't watch 10 minutes for all that they have. I don't care who else does. It's just no interest to me. I've saw something that far transcends anything this planet has to offer. I've saw the Christ. In my heart, I've saw that Christ. And that overshadowed everything else. To know Him, whatever would interfere with that. I want it out of my life. I want nothing in this life that would mar that vision or that would take away my affections. I talked about them this morning. They tell you more. What excites you tells me more about you than anything else. If you're more excited, if you, if you can shout, jump, run, scream at those gladiators and get upset when somebody runs around this church, you're a long ways from what you ought to be. Amen. When this gospel excites a man, then nothing else can excite him. There's nothing beyond that. When that becomes the reality of life, saying that I'm able to come, come to the next thing for the moment. And what was the vision Israel had lost to which the prophets were seeking to bring him back to? The vision, this very vocation for which God laid his hands on Israel was this. God raised Israel up as a nation and set her right in the middle of the nations. Jerusalem is the absolute center of this planet. God put them right there in the middle. God then constitutes Israel on a heavenly divine principles with God himself in the midst with results that all other nations should gather around. They were here as God among the people. And because of it, he said, you're here for signs and wonders, the prophet Isaiah said, among the people. Not to talk about God, not for your exclusiveness that they become, but to manifest God among the people and let them know you're not to go to them, but they can come to you. That's where we are. They are just a type back there, the Old Testament parable of what the church is to be here to manifest this great God. What do the nation take account of? Not the preaching of what they became uh, aware, but not, not, not the preaching, but they're aware that God, the only living God, was there. When Israel was truly what they were, they recognized that immediately. They recognized. You see that. Tell them. There's no mistaken. God is there. Listen. People know. Listen to Rahab the harlot. We know God is with you. I know this city's gone, but I'll help you if you'll save my family. They knew, see, Israel was what God wanted. They heard the echo. God is with those people. Amen. That's a testimony. When that was lost, they're taken captive. They're nothing no more. The church is nothing when that's lost. But that's why we're here, Rahab. Listen, the people are still there with God in their midst. Now I've gathered into that statement the whole of the Bible, old and the new. The only reason that we're here is that the Rahabs of the world recognize God is with us. I can be saved. Oh, I can get out. Oh, my God. Are you listening to me? Let me tell you something, folks. It's not a game men play. It's not a little something for Sunday. I, I know out here in California, and I saw in another place, they go to church with a bikini because it wasn't going to church in the first place. It's going to be. It's just God is not here for that kind of stupidity. God is here to be served that that son may live. Israel was here that the world may know God was alive. Everywhere the testimony, when that Red Sea, I mean, when that Jordan parted, it said the heart of those wicked kings failed. They said that city's gone. One miracle will bring the other. Only God can stop that river's flood died. The waters piled up, stayed still while they gathered the testimony, got across the river. Their hearts failed them. They said, God is among that people, and who? Nebuchadnezzar rose up to say to Daniel, Daniel's God is God. Oh, my God, church, that's why we're here. I said, that's why we're here. Oh, God, be that among us. Come and be that among us again. That the world said, the God of living waters, he is the God of heaven. Yes, sir, that, that's a testimony that God wants to hear out of us.
Not primarily to say things about God, to be as God in the midst of the nations. Think about that. I know that's a statement that fundamentalists will call heresy, but what they called heresy, Paul said, is the salvation and the religion that you and I have come into. We're here that God may be here. That's all. If that ceases to be, we may as well go home, folks. Amen. We're not worth anything. There's no mistaking. God is there. Now, when you come into the New Testament, we find ourselves in the presence of a double development. God is here, present in the person of His Son, Jesus. His name is Emmanuel. God is with us. That's the very name that God gave to it. All who have to do with Him have to do with God in a very, very personal way. He claims His physical body is a temple of God. He made no, no bones about that. He made it very clear God was in Christ. His body become the very, very temple of the living God. Then through death, resurrection, and ascension, he returns in the presence of the Holy Ghost, takes up his residence in that church, which is his body. Now look at it. Things then begin to happen spontaneously out from a world of spiritual intelligence now. It's altogether different. That's not the same Apostle Peter that denied him in Pilate's Hall. Now he has become a temple of God, and his presence anywhere was at God, was there. That's the whole. That's why that we're here. Not because of certain doctrines being preached, but because of a divine presence in their life. That man at Gadara that had enough devils in him to drown 2,000 hogs, come down there naked, come down naked. He wanted to be free. The devils didn't want to, but he did. Jesus set him free. When he got his right mind, he dressed decently. Amen. Put clothes on. I tell you, the devil is the institution of women out there naked on the street or men either one. But when he got clothes, when he got his right mind, he put clothes on and he said to Jesus, I want to go with you. He said, no, 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 no. I, uh, you're not needed with me. You're needed here on this demon-possessed island that wanted me to leave because their hogs drowned. You're needed here. What am I going to do here? I can almost hear him. What will I do here, sir? I don't know theology. I've never been to any Bible school. I'm, I, don't, I don't know the facts of all this. What am I going to do? Tell them. Tell them. Tell them what? What I've done for you. They heard you screaming. They put the chains and you broke them. You terrified this world. Now you walk this street. Tell him I met him. All the theology leads to this. It don't lead to anything else. No, no. If I don't learn him, I learn nothing. Because this book is a book about this Christ. Nothing else. Everywhere and all places all the time. You just tell him, son, what good things I've done for you. And your life is a demonstration of that reality. They are conscious. They, they are conscious intelligence all around behind me in the nation. The conflicts is started not because of what God's people say, but because what they are on this planet. That's the reason the world rulers of darkness want to get rid of us. They don't know why that world rulers of darkness is that reprobate mind that's up there now, the one that wants us to stop calling our parents mom and dad. That's a reprobate mind that's come. It's up there in Washington today. It is a reprobate mind. That thing has come to destroy. They don't know why, but it's because of us, folks. There's a presence here on this planet that don't allow that, that won't go unnoticed with that present. We're here for nothing else. If we're here to get a committee and to make an appeal to the Attorney General to save us, then for God's sakes, let's forget God and get into the political business in the first place. If politics was an answer, Moses would have become the Pharaoh. That's not the answer. It's a church in through which the king of all kings lives, functions, and operates. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, <clears throat> that's the vision, what the church is constituted for in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
That's a whole. That's a lie to the coming day. You're standing as a testimony of that day. You and I, we're to be that, to stand as it. In, in the nations as a testimony, until he comes, whose right it is to rule, we're here to tell the world we have a life that's beyond death. Death is not future with me, it's past. I'm never going to die. If Christ don't come pretty soon, I'll move from Beaumont uh, to ever be in the world of God. Amen. But I'll never die. He died my death. I raise with him. I walk with him. He is our life. That's a testimony that a world must know, must hear, must see if we're going to be affected in our time. They're not interested. Young people cannot, cannot relate to the abstract. But let the church be the church. They can relate to that Christ that lives all the time. A foothold unto that time. An altar bill whose testimony is this belongs to God. The earth is the Lord's, and it is His, and that's a testimony. Now, you'll find every kind of contradiction to that in conditions, e everything. I, I can tell you, folks, if you're looking outside, then you're going to give up. You'll find every, every kind, every kind of assault from the enemy to try to prove that the Lord has not anything there, that He has no footing, and that you had better get out. Everything is going to deal. We are the minority. We've always been the minority, but we've always been the ruling class when we were what God. There's a time in this nation when every politician, before he ever signed a bill, looked over his shoulder to see what this pulpit was saying about that. Today, we don't have nothing to say. We're begging them to let us live. We're begging them to pass a law so that unsaved, ungodly preachers, teachers rather, that won't want my kids to call me a parent and not, not a grandfather. Uh, you know, that kind of a thing is there. And here we're begging them to give us a chance. Beg nobody, nothing. We're the kingdom of God. We're not here to talk with them. We're walk, talk to them. Amen. To tell them what this thing is all about. And if we'll rise up to that occasion, we'll discover no power ever constructed, ever formed, could destroy this church. The gates of hell have concealed them, revealed themselves. Do you see then how necessary to have the vision? You can only do her as seeing him that is invisible. You cannot make it otherwise. You'll succumb to the everyday religion of our time. But if we can see him, who, listen, who is God? So the final appeal is that everything must be adjusted and brought in line with the vision. The one question for us in the service tonight, are people seeing Christ in your life? Nothing else matters. I don't care how religious you are. I don't care how smart you are, how clever you are with your message. If men don't see Jesus in us, we're not a witness. You shall be a witness because Christ will live in you after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Have you been filled or was you filled? How long has it been since you really felt that river pushing and shoving and breaking forth with the unutterable. How long has it been? Without that, there can be no witness of Christ. Nobody ever took knowledge had been with Jesus till after Pentecost. Then God more and more was revealed. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Have you believed to where you can receive Him? That's the two questions before us in this building tonight. Would you stand with us? Father, thank you. Oh, my God, thank you. Oh, for this privilege tonight. For, for 